during the Second World War and immediately there afterwards in a small field um, just at the back of Denny, one and a half miles to the southwest of the town centre, there was a hutted encampment. Um, it started life as uh, an encampment for internees. It then became a POW camp and later on a hostel for foreign um, workers. Now there's almost nothing to see on the field and it's beginning to fade from memory, but it shouldn't be. So what we're going to look at now is the story of Castle Rankin Camp. On the 10th of June 1940, just as France was about to capitulate to the invading Germans, Italy joined the war, unfortunately on the side of the Germans. In Britain, uh, people felt as though they'd been stabbed in the back um, at the moment of dire need. Um, and so there was a huge upsurge in resentment against the Italian community. In Falkirk, the Italians were owners of fish and chip shops, uh, very well known for that. And quite a number of the shops had their windows smashed um, as a result. The Italians aged between 60 and 70 who were in the Falkirk district for less than 20 years and they were first generation were ordered to be interned. Uh, they were classified as enemy aliens and within a few days they were bussed from Falkirk police station to Denny carrying very very few possessions. The place they were going, which was to be their home for almost a year, was the field uh, that we mentioned, which had very quickly been assembled into a camp with wooden huts and canvas tents. Fortunately, of course, it wasn't too far away from Falkirk, and so their families, um, the Scottish wives and children, were able to visit them uh, and provide food and comforts for them. Uh, and the families also looked after the fish and chip shops whilst they were interned. The, the war, of course, dragged on for numbers of years, and in North Africa, um, the campaign was rampant. Uh, by the end of 1941, there were an awful lot of Italian prisoners of war being shipped back into Britain, and the authorities needed to find somewhere to house these people. Scotland was an obvious place because it was quite a, a distance from the centre of the major activity and so right at the very end of that year it was decided to upgrade the camp at Castle Rankin into a POW camp. The camp itself uh, was uh, divided into zones. It was very, very quickly built um, and within months there were three to four hundred Italian POWs there. They were quite happy to be out of the war actually um, and uh, spent a lot of time chatting to the workmen building the camp and to the local people. Uh, they picked up English slowly and amongst the first things of course that they asked for uh, was hair cream um, and toothpaste. The sergeant major of the Italians uh, was a kind of plumpish man um, who used to bawl and shout orders out to, to the men um, and, and would turn red in the face whilst doing so. The camp guards uh, were pioneer corps, uh, who were not first rate troops, but they were quite adequate to protect men who didn't particularly want to escape. The camp was surrounded by a tall wire, barbed wire fence. Uh, anyone could have escaped if they'd really uh, wanted to. Um, it was divided into zones, so if you were entering uh, from the, the minor road from Denny, on the right hand side there was the old pit bing, uh, and on the left hand side was the accommodation for the camp guard and the administration. Straight on would have been the compound, uh, which eventually housed 40 uh, prefabricated huts uh, made with concrete frames, concrete panels uh, and some brick and fill on concrete platforms. They had to be terraced into the hill slope uh, and along the, the main streets they hung Benjamin lamps. So they were suspended from wires and of course on the windswept uh, site they would blow around in the wind quite a lot. One of the huts uh, was used as a multi-purpose recreation centre. So on the Sundays it served as a chapel, uh, 
and as normal, the Italians decorated the, the walls of the chapel with artwork. Uh, along one side of it uh, was a bench, uh, and that was used for uh, recreational purposes such as making musical instruments, violins, guitars, and making small boxes which were then decorated with images from the African campaign, so they would show camels and pyramids and things of that nature. Beyond the, the main accommodation area was a, a, an, enclosement, an enclosed area used for, as allotments and gardens. Uh, that allowed the Italians to grow some of their own food, uh, which they would then make. And further north still was the steep valley of the Castle Ranking Burn. Uh, and here the Italians formed a, a path down the steep slope so that they could get to the pool um, in the stream and use that for bathing in the summer months. Uh, and they also learned how to guddle fish, uh, which they would then cook uh, in the canteen. Whilst the Italians were occupying the POW camp at Denny, uh, it was realised that they could fulfil the shortage of labour on the local farms. Tractors had only been introduced relatively recently and there was very little mechanisation, so the labour that they provided was essential. The, all, they also got to work in some of the local industries, uh, in the paper mill at Caring Grove, for example, and at the brickworks in Bonnybridge at uh, Castle Curry and Milne Quarter. After the Battle of El Alamein, numbers of Italian POWs at Denny increased substantially, uh, reaching a peak of just over 600 um, eventually. But in September 1943, the Italians surrendered. Um, they essentially swapped sides, uh, and uh, the Italians at Denny were given a lot more freedom. Having said that, of course, by that stage, the name Tally Camp was ingrained into the local memory. The strangers in amongst the local community were seen as quite exotic and for some reason that seemed to attract a, a lot of the local girls. So much so that uh, a policeman was put on duty at the end of the road and although it was a public road he was able to demand that they show their identity cards uh, and quite a number of the girls were fined for not having signed them. Uh, a huge whopping sum of 20 shillings at that time. Probably much worse than that was the fact that their names were printed in the Falkirk Herald and you have to imagine the family discussions that would ensued from that. The local boys of course hated the Italians, they saw them as smooth talking greasy yobs um, stealing their girls. On the other hand, um, some thought uh, that they showed a great deal of audacity um, and had silver tongues, so it's a point of view. I spoke to one person who was a member of the post office home guard and at night when he was on guard duty in the telephone exchange he had very little to do and he used to spend his time listening to the Italians chatting up the, the women uh, and he reckoned he learnt a lot of tricks to do uh, of how to handle women, at least that's what he said. Colonel, sorry, Colonel Lieutenant Hans Miller, who was the commandant at the camp, was very interested in music and orchestras, and he encouraged the Italians to form their own orchestra. Uh, they had the musical instruments that they made. They were also able to get donations and borrow some from the local community. After a great deal of practice on the 27th of August 1945, they eventually uh, had a public performance in the Cinema Deluxe. Uh, there were two performances and because Miller wanted to show the kind of work that the Italians were doing, he invited the local people and the leaders of the boroughs in the area. So Provost Allen of Denny and Provost Strachan of Falkirk both came to uh, listen to the music. However, the Provost of Sterling and some of his councillors completely refused to have anything to do with fraternising with the enemy and in fact sent some rather scathing remarks. Well if you do that in Denny it acts as a great publicity stunt and the place was packed out. Um, two performances, the evening one they had to turn people away because there was so, such great demand. <laughs> 
The performance was in the aid of Denny and District Comforts Fund and raised £130 for that particular thing. And uh, as you can imagine, there was Italian opera um, involved. Uh, it was a, a great success and uh, several other performances followed there afterwards. However, in February 1946, it was decided that the Italians had been amongst us for long enough and uh, they marched to Larbert Railway Station for entrainment down to the south coast of England and the journey home. Their departure was met with a great deal of mixed feelings amongst the community. There was a, great, a lot of friendship at the time. Um, probably just as importantly, it meant that the places of entertainment and the shops were going to suffer in terms of their trade. Um, and then a rumour started to arise that they were going to be replaced by German POWs. In March 1946, the expected German invasion happened. Some 700 Germans eventually arrived at the prisoner of war camp in Denny. Um, they arrived by train at Larbert Station, formed up and marched the short distance. Um, one young girl remembered them arriving when she was uh, in the playground at the school and she said a lot of the children spat at them as they passed. One farmer who lived just outside Stirling recalled the Germans first arriving in time for the potato harvest that year. Uh, there was about 20 uh, soldiers. Uh, they were lined up and stood to attention by the sergeant, um, who then spoke to the farmer, asked which fields needed picking. He marched the men out to the fields and they worked very hard uh, throughout the harvest. Uh, and it was often said that whilst the Italians were fun-loving, um, and you'd often hear them singing whilst they were working. The Germans were very hard working. They tended not to hang around waiting to be told what to do. They went out and did whatever was required. At the end of that potato harvest, the farmer was allowed to retain three of the German POWs. He chose the sergeant because he previously worked on farms before the war. Um, the second person he chose was a 17 year old whose father was a minister in Hamburg and then the third person was uh, someone who lived near the Polish border and whose family had been severely mistreated by the Nazis. The camp at Castle Rankin was now fully developed. Um, there was a medical block where the German doctors uh, amongst the POWs looked after their fellow prisoners and there was a bakery where they did their own baking, a workshop uh, where they would uh, make toys and um, little trinkets as souvenirs which they could then give away. There was a canteen, uh, again they did their own cooking, uh, a games and recreation room uh, where they were able to play things like billiards uh, and table tennis, dominoes, cards and the like. They had gardens just like the Italians where they grew flowers for competition um, as well as growing their own vegetables. And then finally, they constructed a concert hall, which was made out of two long army huts. Um, they took the sides out of the huts and grafted the two together. Uh, and that was able to sit 600 um, people in the audience, um, as well as having a stage at the far end. In July that year, um, Hans Miller, the camp commandant, uh, decided that they were ready for a public performance and he invited the farmers um, on whose farms the men were billeted uh, and their wives along uh, to attend the concert. It was a, a great success um, and therefore was repeated on St Andrew's Day uh, later in the year. On that particular St Andrew's Day um, they performed Holy Night uh, using a, their own arrangement uh, and again, that was uh, so well received that they performed it in a number of the churches in Denny itself for that Christmas. The orchestra also had the opportunity to record um, the, the music uh, at Bigger's recording studios in Glasgow. The camp itself continued uh, on until May 1947 uh, when they held the last concert uh, and by the end of that month the prisoners had all left Scotland uh, and returned to Germany.
and an eerie silence fell over the, the field uh, and over the, the town of Denny itself. It didn't last long because in February 1948 a new human cargo arrived in Denny, uh, this time arriving at Denny Station which was deliberately opened for that particular day. These were foreigners again, uh, mainly Ukrainians, Yugoslavs and Poles um, who had volunteered uh, to replace the Germans working on the local farms. Um, they would have been described initially as DPs, uh, meaning displaced persons, uh, but eventually uh, they were known by the title of EVWs uh, rather than POWs, um, and that stood for European Voluntary Workers. Uh, the camp now was called a hostel, uh, and there were families um, as well as the, the men folk themselves. It must have been a very strange time for them. Most were not able to return to their homes because of the economic situation or because they were in the hands of the communists uh, further east. They'd come to uh, an alien culture, an alien climate, and it was very difficult for them to uh, adapt to the locality. By 1953, uh, a new term had arisen, so instead of being EVWs, they were now called foreign workers. Um, and that year, of course, the camp eventually closed permanently. It was taken over by a local businessman who took um, Gunter Ilgner into partnership. Gunter had actually been uh, a guest at the camp whilst it was a German POW camp, and they used it as a pig farm. Eventually, Gunter actually got to own the farm um, in which he'd been detained as a prisoner. Now, of course, the, uh, the sheds are completely gone. There's very little to see on the site other than green fields. But although it's fading from the memory, it should not be forgotten. Because what it represents is shattered lives, reconciliation, friendship and new beginnings. And that's what we should all be thinking about.